Hi, I'm Dr. Paul Lewis Metzger and I'm the director of New Wine, New Wineskins. Welcome to New Wine Tastings, where every week we'll have an opportunity to engage people from diverse backgrounds, all in the attempt to build relational bridges through Jesus in contemporary culture. We are desirous of the opportunity to engage in deep and meaningful ways, and we're really thrilled and excited to have you with us. Hello, I'm Paul Lewis Metzger, the director of the Institute for Cultural Engagement, New Wine, New Wineskins, and today we're going to be discussing orthopathy. Orthopathy, it's not a weed killer, and it's not something that kills conversations as it relates to other faith traditions. It actually opens up healthy, robust conversations, and that's what we're going to be discussing. And my colleagues today are John Moorhead and Phil Wyman. Uh, John Moorhead normally is in the Salt Lake City area. I think that's where he is today. And Phil Wyman is normally in Salem, Mass, but he's been doing a bit of travels. And so uh, we've been working together for several years now in terms of what we call multi-faith interaction and engaging other faith traditions where we account for differences as much, if not more so, than we account for similarities and go through those differences toward constructive forms of engagement with people of other traditions. So we'll have an opportunity to engage that theme as it relates to multi-faith engagement uh, and orthopathy. Uh, I'm going to ask my colleagues to share a little bit about their work. They've done a lot of work even together in terms of how evangelical Christians um, must uh, become much more uh, adept at engaging our pagan neighbors. And so uh, we've done work together in a variety of contexts, but including a grant uh, related to orthopathy and moral intuitions and the affections for the Louisville Institute. I'm going to ask John and Phil to share a little bit more about themselves. Phil thought to have the mask on would help in terms of this Zoom conversation. He just felt that the infectious um, dangers of working with John and me are such that he needed the mask in addition to the Zoom distance. So John and Phil, could you just share a little bit about your work? Well, since uh, Phil has the mask on, I guess I'll go ahead and that'll give him a chance to take it off. I just want to note at the beginning that the, the mask serves multiple functions, including covering a multitude of sins, but uh, we won't talk about Phil's appearance anymore. Um, <laughs> uh, my, I am the, uh, I wear a lot of hats and uh, one of those is I'm the director of uh, the evangelical chapter of the Foundation for Religious Diplomacy as well as Multi-Faith Matters, which came out of the, the Louisville grant that uh, you gentlemen and some other colleagues and partners were a part of. Um, I've been uh, on a personal journey myself for years, coming out of uh, countercult apologetics to uh, missiology and understanding cultures to dialogue uh, to this particular approach that we're pursuing now called Multi-Faith Engagement. And one of the things that uh, I've discovered, and, and you gentlemen have discovered as well, we worked on together is this idea of orthopathy. Evangelicals tend to focus a lot on orthodoxy, which is important right teaching, as well as orthopraxy, the practices that we uh, put into place in the church. Uh, uh, but in addition to that, there's orthopathy, the affections, the emotions. What are the right emotions that we should have, particularly towards those in other religious traditions? And when it comes to paganism, in my experience, and I know Phil see even more of this, that we tend to have a very defensive, negative, angry kind of thing because there are certain religious traditions in their teachings that, that really make us more fearful. Uh, we want to build up a boundary, a sense of us versus them. Um, paganism came on my radar years ago when I was a seminary student. I had some colleagues that I met in Australia who were doing some creative outreach uh, in uh, New Age festivals. They were interacting with pagans as well. And I flew out there to see what they were doing. And they said, you really got to take a look at contemporary paganism. It's a really interesting uh, religious tradition. And I did that when I was in seminary. I made uh, a field study visit to some uh, local Asatru uh, pagan groups. And we developed relationships. Online, I developed relationships with pagans. And it was uh, a challenging process for me to get rid of my stereotypes to understand what they were about. And it was also a challenge for them because uh, many pagans have a lot of concerns about Christianity and about Christians, about our behavior. It's perhaps our behavior towards Christians historically as well in the present that has caused a lot of friction and built up a lot of barriers. Um, let me just uh, complete this introductory section with one more thing to mention. One of the projects I worked on was I brought together a uh, Christian colleague of mine in Australia, Philip Johnson, and an American Wiccan 
Gus de Zariga, and they came together and they uh, did a dialogue book called Beyond the Burning Times, where they discussed key areas of spirituality between our two religious traditions. And uh, it, as far as I know, it's the first uh, book treatment where representatives of these two traditions came together. And uh, it was well received by representatives of both religious traditions. Thanks, John. Thanks very much. And Phil, uh, if you could oh. share a little bit with or without the mask. I am in Long Beach, California. <laughs> it's a center for COVID. And of course, we have to be protected at all times. And uh, <laughs> I, that, that, that's how I always look. <laughs> this, is, this is the TV me. <laughs> So, uh, so I'm in Long Beach, California right now, and I'm here because I'm uh, taking care of my mom who has uh, uh, dementia. So I'm caring for her, um, the full-time caregiver. But um, up until that point, I was doing work in um, festivals, and previous to that was uh, a pastor in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, and I'd moved there back in 99, um, specifically to plant a church, and in a sense, uh, I guess, to move in with the pagans, you know, because the population of uh, witches, specifically, in Salem, Massachusetts, is quite large. It's, you know, and the numbers in the thousands for a city of 40,000, that's, you know, you're a you're hundred times more likely, maybe a thousand times more likely to meet a witch in Salem than you are any place in the world. Um, so, um, I spent time getting to know them, um, developing relationships with them, and then in the last three or four years, started traveling full time and working in festival settings. And um, and and so, my work with neo pagans, which had already expanded to the UK and the rest of the United States, um, expanded even more because there's you find quite a bit of uh, alternative spirituality in festival settings, whether, you know, it's something big like Glastonbury or, um, you know, small fairy festivals in Cornwall. And then in this full-time travel, I was um, also traveling with rubber tramps and dirty kids, you know, uh, rainbows, these uh, hippies and full-time travelers uh, that are any anything from, you know, uh, uh, grandma and grandpa who were in a motorhome <laughs> decided to travel full time to um, homeless kids who are living in rainbow gatherings. Uh, you know that are those are like hippie enclaves that uh, meet out in the woods, um, and you could live in them full time, going from one to the other through the year. Uh, so, so that's that's at least where I've been. What I've been doing around the United States, UK, and Czech Republic in the last three or four years and here in long beach right now fending off covid with my plague doctor mask when you had said before that uh <clears throat> you know you're used to wearing masks people wear masks a lot in salem but they're just much better right than the masks that we're currently wearing for covid <laughs> that's, that right. that's right that's <laughs> right so and again um uh blessings to your mother and you uh, in this um uh, difficult season so uh We've determined uh, that a missing key ingredient from our work with the Louisville Institute for engagement of other faith traditions is orthopathy. And John, you alluded to it just a little bit. This is something that I think all of us who are part of the team, uh, <clears throat> David Hahn, Mark Shuttler, Kerry Graham, ourselves, uh, Bob Roberts before that, and uh, uh, and others who've been a part of this have indicated that we really need to be sensitive to it. Phil, if there, could you just ask them to hold off on taking you away until after the interview? So, uh, so that we've determined that orthopathy, the, the emphasis on right passions, must accompany um, right practice, orthopraxy, and also right doctrine, orthodoxy. Uh, now there's a little bit of an echo. So. Um, John, you recently published a book on that subject. Uh, tell us a little bit more about what orthopathy is. Um, and as I said earlier, it's not a weed killer. It's not like ortho. And why it is important for multi-faith engagement. Um, and share us a 
with us about the book too. And I'm gonna share my screen so that people can see the actual book cover at, at, this, at this time. Can you see that? Yes. Great. So Thanks. John, you wanna share a little bit about this recent book that uh, some have found it to be a real breakthrough in terms of the discussion of Christ charitable orthopathy. Christian Perspectives on Emotions and Multi-Faith Engagement, which you edited with Brandon Benzinger. The book came about as a direct outcome, one of the outcomes from our Multi-Faith Matters grant project. But before that, it was a several year journey on my part to get to the place where we were ready to tackle it in book length treatment. Uh, as I was working through my own faith journey, I mean, years ago, I, I was involved a lot in apologetics. I did uh, culturally sensitive evangelism to people in new religious movements. But I, I just kind of got to the place where I was asking myself and my own discipleship, what does it look like for me to be a faithful disciple of Christ in the midst of a, an increasingly post-Christendom, religiously plural world where many people, perhaps the majority that I engage with, no matter how positively, simply choose not to embrace the gospel message. How do I live faithfully as a Christian in the midst of religious pluralism? And uh, as I was reading materials along those lines, I found a, a journal article by uh, our colleague Terry Muck, uh, who was taught at Asbury Seminary. He was former editor of Christianity Today. Uh, for a while, he was the director of uh, the Louisville Institute. He's been involved for a number of years in Buddhist Christian dialogue and has been working through that process. What does that mean for Christians? be faithful in that process. And in one journal essay, he was trying to define various ways you can look at uh, interreligious dialogue. And one of the ways he talked about it just stood out for me. He described uh, interreligious dialogue as an emotion and attitude or a way of life. And I was just struck by that. It was simple and profound at the same time. And it stuck in the back of my brain for years. And I really think this book is the outworking of that. Um, as I have looked at my own tribe, a lot of the work that, that we do is not only interfaith between religious traditions, it's also intrafaith. We try to work within our own religious community to understand the dynamics going on within ourselves and why we relate to people in other religious traditions the way that we do. And in my experience, at least, uh, I've seen a lot of evangelicals either ignore people in other religious traditions and just do their own Christian thing, or... Uh, they react very defensively. We tend towards apologetics, denunciation, building walls rather than bridges. And I wanted to understand why that was. What's the psychology underneath the theology, right? We uh, evangelicals love theology. We love scripture. Uh, but in my view, I think uh, it, it was fascinating to me watching the dy dynamic. Why do people like Paul Metzger and Phil Wyman look to certain Bible passages and have a very different theology than maybe somebody living next to a Muslim mosque that is defensive and looks to a different set of biblical texts and has a different theology, one of, of opposition. And so to understand that, uh, we did a lot of research in, in bringing social psychology and other areas of science into dialogue with theology. And we discovered that there really is this problem with, uh, there's a negative orthopathy that a lot of evangelicals have, where we are fearful of the other, we are defensive as a result, and we engage in various forms of apologetic, maybe even prejudice, as a way of protecting the boundaries around our own faith. And so this book, A Charitable Orthopathy, brought together scholars, Christian scholars, not just evangelicals, uh, to look at different facets related to orthopathy so that we can do an, have an interfaith conversation with ourselves and unpack the significance of orthopathy and how we might improve it as it relates to people in other religious traditions. Oh, thank you, John. And I know that uh, some of the research you've done uh, engages Jonathan Haidt's work on moral foundations, his social psychology. You dealt with neuroscience. Uh, I know you've looked at the Pew research and just how evangelicals tend to be more antagonistic toward atheists, Muslims, uh, perhaps in some context, um, pagans, uh, than we might be toward other traditions. And it's it's interesting to explore that, isn't it, to find out why that is. And I think it's, it's often because of the sense of threat, that there's more of a threat. Like you said, if one's living closer to a particular uh, faith community, 
you might feel like there's more tension that uh, one has to account for and one gets more defensive. And none of this, I should make clear to our viewers, is uh, an attempt to discount Orthodox Christian faith. We're emphasizing orthopathy today, but this isn't about undermining or putting aside Christian doctrine. As Paul says to Timothy, watch your life and doctrine closely, because if you do, you will say both yourself and your hearers. So he says, watch that, your life, so orthopraxy, your doctrine, orthodoxy, um, he, he says to account for that. Um, Proverbs also says, above all else, guard your hearts, for it is the wellspring of life. So we're to watch our doctrine, our life, our hearts. And, and, and also part of that with our hearts is what's going on when we engage people? Is our impulses, our negative um, response or reaction, is that really bound up with our faith? Um, is that what neighborliness really entails being a good neighbor? Not compromising on doctrine, not compromising on our moral stances, but also not compromising on care for our neighbor. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus never seemed to have a litmus test on whether to care for the neighbor lost on the way, beaten near death. The Samaritan didn't give them give him the litmus test, but simply cared. I think that orthopathy was quite charitable. Phil, you've worked a lot, as we've said before, um, uh, uh, in uh, Salem, Mass. And uh, orthopathy certainly comes into, your, into play for you. Uh, as you engage the pagan community. Could you just share about how that looks in your own context? And I'll stop sharing the screen at this point, but I do encourage okay. our viewers uh, to uh, get the book. It's, it's a phenomenal collection of essays. Phil. Um, yeah, so uh, when, I, when I first, I, I should go back a little before I moved to Salem. So when I moved there in 99, I had already done quite a bit of study on uh, American neo-paganism. And I did that specifically because, um, not because I, I needed to know what they believed doctrinally. I had spent years already working in understanding other religions, what they believed, and you know, as typical evangelical, um, <laughs> or because Pentecostal evangelical, maybe atypical. Um, we understand what others believe and we understand that from an intellectual perspective of their theologies, right? Um, and, and neo-paganism is, is kind of a, a spaghetti pile <laughs> of, of thought because each person is so remarkably different and they would view that as a, a positive thing, of course. But to me, that wasn't significant enough. So I had to go on an anthropological study. Um, you know, so this for me was an anthropological missiology on understanding a people group, not just what they believed, but how they felt about things and what made them tick, what they got excited about, why, why they thought about me the way they thought about me. So, you know, I started in Southern California where I was pastoring a church and uh, I'll re I remember the first uh, pagan festival I went to. Um, my friend Jeff Manasco and I, we went up into the mountains of uh, above LA um, and we had to drive up this lonely road in the mountains until we turned on a dirt road and we went down the dirt road till we had to turn on another dirt road to find a locked gate and then we had a code to get in and lock the gate behind us and go a mile down into this valley where uh, where the pagans were waiting for us, right? And, and of course, we had in our minds all of these different things that, you know, people were saying to us post, this is, this is uh, early, mid-90s, and so it's post the 1980s with its satanic scares. And so we're, you know, we're being told, well, you know, they're going to be practicing sky clad. You know what that is, right? just clad with nothing but the sky, you know, so everybody's telling us it's going to be a big naked event. And then um, others are saying, are, are, aren't you afraid of being the sacrifice at the feast? So, 
<laughs> so we unlock the gate and drive behind it and relock it behind us and look at each other and it's like, here we go. Um, and we had just an absolutely brilliant time sitting down with people at a um, an idol building workshop talking about the Ten Commandments and them enjoying the conversation with us, you know, and I'm scratching my head thinking, wow, this is the craziest thing I've, <laughs> I think I've ever done. Um, you know, and then later moving to Salem as a new pastor planting a church in town, I walked into each of the witchcraft shops in Salem. This is Salem, Mass again. Just you know, Yeah, Salem, anymore. Massachusetts, the famous uh, witch trial town. And, and you say that word in, in many nations around the world, it's one of the most famous cities of 40,000 people <laughs> in the world. <laughs> you say Salem, they go, the Salem? <laughs> so uh, I, I move into Salem and I visit each of the witchcraft shops and it, it would be a surprise for people to, to visit and discover there's, there were 14, I think, at that time. And that's pretty common for a city of 40,000 people. That's just remarkable. I don't think London has that many. And that's, that's like the, that's the home or the heart of uh, the rise of neo-paganism in Western culture. But uh, I visited each of them and, and I said, hi, I'm Pastor Phil. I'm a new pastor in town. And I uh, just want to introduce myself. I realize there's been quite a bit of tension between our communities over the years, and I'm hoping to do something to help alleviate that. So I just wanted to introduce myself. And I'd already done some work meeting people. So some people were at least open to it, and others were like, get out of my shop. There were a couple like that. For the most part, people were gracious, but questioning. And so it took some years. Um, to break down some of those barriers. It, um, but I, I remember one of the first shops I visited, a young man was in there listening to my introduction and he started talking to me about being a pastor. And, and, and so he just went after Christianity. It was all about power and it was all about greed. And, I, I, and, and he went down this litany of things that the church had done in human history. And I just, I just looked at him and I, I'd shake my head and smile and, and agree, mm-hmm, you're right, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And as he was saying that, he started losing steam as he talked about gold and power and how evil the church was. And I kept nodding and he finally just completely ran out of steam and just looked at me like, what? And I said, you're completely right. Uh, the church has been like this down through history and sometimes is still like that today. It seems the problem's growing worse, you know, uh, in, in evangelicalism over the recent years. And so I feel we have to say this again, make this apology. I said, I'm so sorry for that. Um, I know a number of people who've been burned by the church and we moved into town hoping to change that um, because I don't think that's how Jesus would live. And, and this guy's argument just went poof. And all of a sudden we had a normal conversation that wasn't adversarial. Um, so, so for me, a big part of my apologetics of Christianity in the, the early days of uh, being in Salem was an apology. <laughs> I'm sorry, the church has been like this. We're hoping to change that a little bit. And, you know, of course it all came to a, uh, a head uh, in terms of these relationships back in 2006 when the Foursquare denomination decided to simultaneously give us a grant, a fairly significant grant for what we were doing and kick us out <laughs> because there, there was this tension between, uh, you know, whatever, whatever we want to call it, old guard, new guard, conservative, and, you know, more uh, liberal, not in a theological sense, but liberal in a sense of uh, more missional, more missional. Yeah, our our praxis of of engaging people and um, and accepting them. Um, that that tension rose, and we got booted out, excommunicated, and you know, and as you know, it that hit the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Um, it was two thousand. It was Halloween Day of uh, two thousand six, and 
the grant was given on the basis of we had developed good relationships with neo-pagans and the church was looking at that and saying, we don't know anybody else in the world who's doing this. And for myself back at that time, when I first started, John was one of the, those first people that, you know, as I'm looking around for somebody else, who else is doing this work? John, the guys in Australia and um, Steve Holling, Hollingsworth in the UK were John Drain were a handful of people who were doing this kind of thing that I found. There was a man in, in Denmark as well um, who was doing this kind of work, but there were, it felt like there were a handful of us among evangelicals who were willing to engage people at a relationship level and not treat it as some dangerous thing to keep away, you know? Um, so, you know, that, very early, I don't know that we particularly used a word for it then. We weren't using the word um, orthopathy to describe our practice of hearing others and relating to others. We were just trying to do that work, um, you know, back in the early 90s through, um, you know, then moving to Salem in 99. But, but we discovered that unless we did that, we weren't going to be heard. Yeah, it's so important what you're saying and how you and John have modeled it in so many contexts. And, you know, even when we did the Louisville grant, we were trying to think through how many pastoral leaders, academics in our evangelical and Pentecostal domain are engaged in this type of work. And there are some, of course, but it, it wasn't really easy, was it, to try and to discern who might be willing to collaborate. We're grateful for the participation of Jill Riley, uh, who is pastoring in Montana and just doing some phenomenal work there. And uh, as we've already mentioned, Bob Roberts, Carrie Graham, Mark Shuttler, uh, David Hahn, uh, you, Phil, John, myself, and again, others have collaborated with us in different contexts. And now this book and the work that you're doing, Phil, in so many contexts. I know John only has a couple more minutes today, correct, John? I think that's the case. Unfortunately, yes. So I'm wondering if we could pick this conversation up and, and develop it further um, in uh, the coming days. But while, John, you head off, maybe Phil and I could uh, delve a little bit further into some of his work. And then uh, we'll pick it up where we bring you in for more discussion with the grant. Uh, and some of these related themes that we're exploring further now. How does that sound? Sounds great to me. Let me just make one closing comment, if I could, picking up on what Phil was saying there towards the end. You know, he said years ago, we didn't really call it orthopathy. We were just doing this practice of relating to others and loving them. And I think that's important. I think a lot of people have been, in, have been pursuing a positive Christian orthopathy without really doing the reflection and unpacking about what that means. And, and a part of what we tried to do in the grant, what we're trying to do in the book and continue beyond the book is really understand, do the hard work of saying, what does this positive orthopathy, what's it all about? And how can we do better? How can we, through reflection on that, improve on what we've been doing over the years and understand better why our hearts have been transformed towards others and other people and other religious traditions have viewed us more positively. And so we're, we're just trying to be faithful disciples and unpack that whole orthopathic process. And, and just before you go, John, uh, it reminds me of the, how we met. Uh, Rob Redman, the former dean of Multnomah Seminary, where I teach, had uh, encouraged uh, us to bring you in as a seminary faculty to discuss some of these types of issues. You also spoke for a New Wine, New Wineskins conference on lifestyle evangelism. And we're really trying to honor the legacy of Dr. Uh, Joseph Aldrich, who was the former president of Multnomah, wrote that book on lifestyle evangelism. And that's a precursor in certain respects to the work we're doing. He quoted Floyd McClung in the book of YWAM, uh, who was a phenomenal missional leader for YWAM, where McClung had said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's orthopathy. I don't care what you call it. That's orthopathy. And that's what Joe Aldrich was seeking to develop. Uh, we're about evangelism as evangelicals and Pentecostals, but we're also wanting to be good neighbors and we don't sit there and use the neighborliness as a ploy. And I know that sometimes is a, a, 
a concern that people have is this just a ploy, this neighborliness, this friendship. Yeah. For us, it's like whether someone wants to become a Christian ever, we still want to be their friends. So it's not a bait and switch. And I think, as Phil said, it takes a long time to build trust because we've hurt trust. And there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of trauma. And uh, it takes uh, the of patience. patience. And like. And so we'll talk more about this. John, thanks for joining us. Um, and uh, uh, I'm excited for this book, its release, and how it's gaining steam. So thank you for editing it. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. And I just want you guys to know that you two guys, as well as my other team members, you guys inspire me, uh, you challenge me, you keep me grounded, and you keep me sane, and, and you inspire me all the time. So I couldn't do what I do, uh, either by myself or in partnership, without you guys being a part of it. So thank you much. And Phil, we have that recorded because he's never said that before. It, just the opposite. That, that we keep him sane? Yeah. <laughs> That's not what I've heard. Are you uh, are you sure that's the word you want to use? <laughs> maybe, maybe appropriately off balance. How about that? <laughs> yeah. Thanks, John. Thanks, guys. Yeah. So, Phil, um, let's go further into this. And if it's okay with you, I'd like to think through what you're doing. I've always just been so um, impacted by your spirit, your thoughtfulness. Uh, your missional thrust. I know you work a lot with Alan Hirsch and, and, and of course, others in the missional domain. And, you know, as uh, you just really are a hybrid type of person um, <laughs> accounting for theory in missional um, studies and also right. really embedded practice that's lifelong. It's, it's the long haul yeah. with you. And, you know, it reminds me of Paul and Mars Hill, you know, and some people jettison that text thinking, well, by the time he got to Corinth, he realized that this approach that he had in Mars Hill is wrong. Because, uh, he's anti-philosophy by the time he gets to Corinth because of what he says. And I say, with all due respect, I don't see that at all. I think he's using profound philosophical analysis with rhetorical theory to right. challenge a certain kind of philosophical construct that would oppose the, the crucified risen Jesus, because he says the wisdom of God is foolishness to man and right. um, uh, power of God is weakness to man. Um, but it's not that he's doing away with philosophy and discourse and, and such. It's a cruc crucis centric. It's a Christocentric thrust. And for right, right. evangelicals who embrace David Bevington's quadrilateral, you know, crucicentrism is one of those. And that's what Paul's after. I mean, you know, he gave birth to that kind of thrust, you know, as following Christ. So right. I don't see what he's doing in Mars Hill as at all something that he jettisoned. I think that is par for the course with him. And the idea that he only focused on the resurrection. No, he couldn't have gotten to the resurrection apart from going through the cross. He said, God will judge the world through this one he raised from the dead. And he knew that that was a stumbling block to the philosophers on Mars Hill because the whole doctrine of the denial of the resurrection was what the Areopagus was built on with Mars and such right. that we know yeah. that there's no resurrection, so don't capitally punish this individual. That's part of the mythical tradition on which the Areopagus was built. So I just want to say that at the outset, because I even had a student, thoughtful student, uh, winsome student say, you know, why are you making such use of Mars Hill in Acts 17 at the outset of this class on world religions? Because we all know that that's the month by the time he gets to corn. And then I said, well, I begged a different. I gave many reasons yeah, yeah. why, some of which I just outlined. So no disrespect intended to those individuals, but we do know why we hold to this being uh, uh, a seminal uh, account in Paul's ministry. And so Acts 17 I would just like to ask you today, Phil, if you could just develop from your own context how you in your own way may be seeking to engage that. I mean, I don't know what you make of idols. Paul certainly grieved over the idols that he saw in right. Athens as a good God-fearing Jew. You were talking about the Ten Commandments before and, and having that dialogue and you're scratching your head, right? Because that's what I'm yeah, yeah. scratching my head with working with love. Like, I wasn't trained for this. And uh, But could you right. just speak to that? And, you know, I see orthopathy with Paul. I see orthodoxy because he does talk about the centrality of Jesus Christ, uh -huh. resurrection of the dead, judgment through him. Um, and you see orthopraxy is, is just the way in which he engages with humility, though he challenges. Um, he's invited in. He's not imposing. I, I find that good practice. So I see orthodoxy, right. orthopraxy, orthopathy, 
just his grief. That's a orthopathy, uh, orthopathy point, with grieving over the idolatry, but also seeing something in that unknown God mm -hmm. idol through, through which he could right. make positive connections uh, and try sure. to build rapport. So your thoughts, Phil? Um, so after, um, or during the process of developing relationships with neo-pagans, going into their shops, going to their festivals, meeting them and hanging out with them and then making them a part of my daily life. And, and in Salem, it literally was that, it was daily life. They would come in and out of the church regularly because we had a facility that was on the main strip of uh, the tourism. And, and so all the witchcraft shops were part of that tourism, right? And so they would come in and out and hang out, hang out with me. And, you know, they'd call me in the middle of the night when they're having problems. Uh, you know, so I, I really lived among them. Um, and, and in a strange sense, probably in the way Paul might talk about um, his Jewish brethren still being his tribe, even though, you know, he's a Christian, they're not, but they're still, you know, I'm of them in a way. There was a strange way in which I, I felt a little bit like that. This was, this was a pastoral concern and almost a tribal thing that I, I began to understand and be a part of, you know, though I could never fully be part of the tribe because I certainly don't believe as, as they believe in, in terms of the core values of my Christianity and Christ and his cross being at the center of it. But um, the, in that process, I began to see Paul very differently. And I, if it wasn't for Paul, I don't know if I could have navigated this mm -hmm. in a biblical mm -hmm. way. Because here was an individual who lived in a pagan world, right? Um, and, and so when he talked about meat offered to idols, I was like the only guy I knew <laughs> who had to deal with that literally. Hmm. I, you know, no longer was it a theoretical thing, you know, you know, like I, I remember, you know, early days of my Christianity, people were wondering, okay, um, I don't want to drink. What if somebody offers me a beer, you know, oh, is that a, <laughs> is, does that fit here? Or, or I, I do drink and, um, and if somebody finds out, they stumble. That's how we applied that, right? Now I had to apply it in terms of this is literally offered to idols. Can I eat it? <laughs> so it, it, was a very, it was a very different world. And Paul was one of the few people perhaps uh, trying to look at St. Patrick. But what we know of him historically is so little. These were individuals that now were my mentors in a world of which I felt like I had no mentors. And so that's St. Patrick of Ireland, right? Or in Ireland. Right, right. Yeah, the, 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 the one we tip our Guinness to every March 17th, right? Mm -hmm. and, and he was probably as teetotaler as they came. <laughs> so, so it's a funny change in, in history. But um, Mars Hill, I, you know, so, so there's this element of it of which Paul is looking at the culture he's a part of, which is very pagan, Roman pagan culture, and, and trying to navigate it. But then there's another part of it that I think Mars Hill represents, and, and that is that he became all things to all people. And if you're standing up on the Areopagus and you're arguing you know, philosophers are arguing with one another. I become a philosopher among the philosophers, right? He did. He didn't. He 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 spoke their language, their language of debate, their language of provocative thought, right? So I I actually have a an unknown god character that I utilize in my relationship with neo pagans, and that's what we call the Green Man. Um, all over cathedrals and um, and abbeys in England, France, and Germany, there's this character that um, has, I, I, I suppose I embody it pretty well, wild hair and beard that looks like either the leaves of spring or the brambles of, of winter or the fruit of summer all around this head. And there's been no name for this 
um, grotesque, you know, this carving in, in the walls of the cathedral um, until the, about the beginning of the 20th century, somebody made a remark. It says if they were discovering them again, suddenly there were thousands of them all over, um, all over the country of England and they called it the green man. And the pagans adopted the green man as kind of an unknown God. He doesn't have a name. Um, some people connect it to uh, Sir Nunos and, um, but, but for the most part, it was just the green man. And, and so I actually have a green man costume and um, and, and, I, and I've done some sermons on the green man. Uh, here I'm taking this imagery of a face that transitions through the seasons of the year from winter to spring to summer to fall, or, or we might start it with from fall to winter to the birth of spring and the fruit of summer. And, and this face, it doesn't have a name and at one moment it seems to be angry and the next moment it's happy and laughing and celebrating and it going through the seasons to me it looked like the picture of jesus himself in death and in um you know adult, it, it's a little bit of man and of jesus the fall of humanity and jesus who comes down to be with us and the death that he's buried in and the resurrection um, in spring and then coming into summer. I, I had before me my own unknown God. And, and Paul had given me this great example of it um, as he's on Mars Hill. And, you know, and so I'd get dressed up as the green man and walk around Salem um, during October and, and people would stop me. And so some would say, oh, it's Treebeard. <laughs> and the next and the next person would say you're the green man <laughs> is that right they would say that yeah, yeah absolutely awesome. yeah so so i see him in, in uh in the apostle paul the best example that i have for navigating these different worlds and these different thoughts that people have um you know in, in one world it's very intellectual you know paul said to the Greeks, I am like a Greek, and, and there it wasn't about signs, it was about intellect, right? And among the Jews, it wasn't about the intellect, it was about the signs. And so he was going to become all things to all people and, and navigated that intellectually, emotionally. Um, so yeah, I'm with you. I don't, I don't see Mars Hill as a mistake. I think I see it as one of his most brilliant moments. Yeah, and, you know, so again, we're talking about Acts 17 with the story of Mars Hill, where he's at the Areopagus, on the Areopagus. Uh, uh, they're always engaging in new ideas, and uh, he's in town. They no doubt heard him in the marketplace uh, engaging people, and they invited him uh, to share. And, and I think, you know, what I, I hear from you, I think, was true in Paul. He's constantly rustling, right? I mean, he's being stretched at New Wine. We talk about being stretched as new wineskins by Christ's holy love and how that just continues his teaching, his way of life, his person challenges us. Um, and, you know, Christ is constantly pushing us never away from himself, but to go where he goes. And um, Paul and Mars Hill, you are alluding to first Corinthians nine, he becomes all things to all people. So as to save some, he won't even in that same text earlier in that chapter, won't allow the Corinthians to be his patrons and cover his bills, so to speak, because he knew what that would mean, that he would be no longer free to share the good right. news in their midst. And by doing it free of charge, they couldn't have any control over him. And the whole point was he wanted the gospel to be free. He was the, as F.F. Bruce says, the apostle of the heart set free. So he's uh, constantly being stretched. He's constantly willing to be enslaved and to change course, not in terms of his relationship yeah. with Christ, but because of Christ, he's willing to be stretched as someone who had been very much antagonistic toward Jesus. And, you know, when he was killing Christians and such, and then he's radically converted on the Damascus Road. I mean, he goes from someone who was probably very bigoted against Gentiles, even though he was trained in a Hellenistic Jewish country, but he was still a Pharisee right. of Pharisees, as he says in Philippians 3, that, you know, if they think they're the true blue, the ones who are the true Pharisees, I'm even more so. 
as someone who had adhered to the law. But whatever is to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything lost compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. So I sense with you too, because it's cost you a lot. It's cost you a lot <laughs> yeah, yeah. to do this in so many ways. And we, we won't go into all of it today, but I've always just been a huge um, fan and fan's not the right word. Cause you know, fan fame. I mean, I just cherish you. And I, I'm a, I'm oh, a, thanks. I'm a guy who just likes to celebrate Phil Wyman because I think <laughs> Phil is, Phil's leading the charge and how to engage. And, you know, again, first Corinthians nine becoming all things to all people. So that by all possible means, some may be saved. And that was his heartbeat. Right. But, you know, yeah. there are a lot of times where we don't have the opportunity. Paul was going door to door. He's going town to town. Um, a lot of us don't have that opportunity. We have to be, as Peter said, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that's within you. And always to do so with gentleness and respect. Sometimes, as John learned, he said, what about those times when I can't share? Do I just, you know, not engage at all? No. Good right, neighbor. Right, right. And so, right, right. You know, and again, it's not the bait and switch. It's you long to be a good friend and a good neighbor, regardless of someone wants to become a Christian. It's not like you invite them to a Tupperware, I mean, party, and you don't tell them it's right, Tupperware right. or Amway. No, it, you're telling them <laughs> we're getting together. And uh, I remember Eugene Pitzel Waters, who came into my world religions class. You know Eugene, I'm going to assume. Yeah, yeah. Know. And he said, you Christians are horrible at foreplay. And I thought, oh, it's hard enough having a pagan come and speak in my world religions class and he's starting off with this and he said, yeah you invite me out for coffee and as soon as we're out for coffee you're you're trying to reach me for christ and it's like if you really want to reach me for christ be my friend and i just thought what a powerful challenge to us as evangelicals great imagery I mean, to huh? practice what we preach you know and, and yeah. so on and so forth and you kind of remind me of Tom Bobadil, Bombadil a bit. Uh, I don't know if he's the green man too in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> he completely is. He's my favorite character in the Lord of the Rings and the movies left him out. Yeah, I know. And he's the green right? man, I think. I think he's yeah, the yeah, green yeah. man. Yeah. So, um, Phil, any closing thoughts? And we'll, we'll have opportunity to engage us. I'd, I'd like for you to tell people about your work a bit um, just uh, before we close. And this is not the last time we'll be engaging. Um, yeah. You know, you've had me on your... Uh, you know, uh, broadcast uh, and, and the like. Tell us about uh, your YouTube channel. And tell us about your writing, what you're okay. currently researching and such. No, oh, I'm all over the place. I, you know, I, I, I write books like I read books, seven to nine at a time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I've got so many things I, I've Love got it. going on. Um, a little more difficult in this season to to keep at pace with it, um, but uh, so I, I've got the Wild Theology podcast. You can find that uh, my name Phil Wyman on YouTube. W Y M A N Phil Wyman. P H I L W Y M A N. Um, just just uh, you know a couple letters off from the Rolling Stones bass player, right? And, and and the Stones played at Glastonbury too. I've I've seen them uh, on YouTube. That's, they you know, they played Glastonbury. I now I didn't see them at Glastonbury. I wasn't there for that. But uh, I watched it. Yeah. I've seen I've seen some pretty amazing bands at Glastonbury. My favorite was to see or the favorite wasn't my favorite concert at Glastonbury, but my favorite uh, kind of experience was to go with my goth vicar Anglican vicar goth friend Diana to see the cure oh, wow. last year wow that wow. was that was a lot of fun yeah that's <laughs> so, so, so th Phil this Wyman is a Wyman. nod to and this is a nod to diana who's doing the same kind of work living in the town of glastonbury and being a vicar and the neo-pagans absolutely love her to pieces what's her name again diana dingles greenfield hmm. so Wonderful. and when i'm in the uk we're usually working together in some festival somewhere or you know uh, your are yeah so yeah, and so, yeah, yeah. Uh, Phil Wyman. Uh, uh, also on Patreon.com um, slash Phil Wyman. Um, and then uh, in, in terms of, uh, well, what I'm, what I'm working on, I'm, 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 I'm processing the gospel as a um, inherently nomadic um, uh, experience that unless it's a moving thing and 
and unhinged from specific locality that it loses its heart and life. Um, and yet, I, I think in that, if it, you know, as, as I'm processing that, it doesn't mean that if we're not nomadic, we can't engage with it wholly. But I think it's, uh, what that also means is that it's not just that we need to go to the world, but we, have, we need to recognize the world already comes to our door. Hmm. You know, and particularly if you live in a place like you do, Portland, or where, you know, where I was living in Salem, Massachusetts, the world was coming to my door and, and I was in some way responsible for that, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I needed to be a meter and a greeter yeah. for my city. And, and not just for my city, but then also, uh, by extension, the kingdom of God. Yeah. I needed to be a meter and greeter um, for people. And, um, and then uh, I, I, may, I have, am slowly working on a second part to Burning Religion, a um, book I put out in, it was 2015. Um, it, it's, it's destined to become, it's just my goal to become a trilogy. Everybody does things in trilogies, wonderful. right? <laughs> What's that? I said wonderful. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and the working title of that is Clowns in the Pulpit. Um, continuing on my thoughts of Bakhtinian carnivalesque philosophy, that carnival is a means of revolution, and the gospel itself is kind of a carnivalesque, turn the world upside down, blow our minds experience, right? Yeah, the Feast of Fools. That's right. Absolutely. And we are fools for Christ, you know, so, so taking that to extreme, but also challenging that thought because not all clowns are good clowns. And, and then sometimes what we would consider to be the evil clown, the dark the mask, the um, almost horror imagery, that's not always the evil clown either. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's the smiley face that deceives us, right? And so we see that both in po politics and religion. And so, I, you know, I want to navigate that space um but then you know in in, in terms of uh this orthopathic practice one of the things i i'm also working on is a, a clearer way to describe how important it is for us to get to know people not not just as their set of beliefs, but as individuals. It's, it's not a, and not, a, and not simply to do it in kind of our traditional um, ecumenical way, which has often been, let's find out what we agree about. Mm -hmm. And then when we discover what we agree about, well, then we can make peace and be friends. And then it almost as if it stops there. Um, but I think we need to learn to discover how we're different and to listen to that peacefully. But then after I've discovered how somebody's different than me, not just to frame it within how do I argue against that, mm -hmm. you know, put a little box in there that says, oh, here are my biblical argumentations against what they believe. But now to find out how what they believe, how that makes them tick. Maybe there's something in what they believe that can benefit even my Christianity. Yeah. And there's things that may struggle against my Christianity. But then what makes them tick? How do they think about the way that I feel, right? Uh, about what I think. What's going on in their emotions and their intellect when I tell them what I believe? And if I can understand that more deeply, I understand them more deeply. Now, if I only go around discovering how you agree with me, then I really haven't met Paul Metzger. I've only met Phil Wyman in Paul Metzger. Mm -hmm. To meet Paul Metzger, I have to know what it is you think differently, how you, how you tick, what is it that you'd say, Phil, you're, you know, you're off the rails. <laughs> and, and I think you're a nut. Stop and then, you're out of your element. That's, that's, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and, and when I do that, I think I now come to a place where I've met you. If I can understand not just how you feel about what you feel, but how you feel about what I feel, mm -hmm. what you think about what I think, right? Now, now I've begun to meet Paul Metzger. And, and it's particularly true 
um, among those that we are radic the radical other, those people who are radically different than ourselves in thought and emotion, um, for us to really understand them, we have to go to that level, you know, as it, that's incarnational ministry, right? That's the terminology. We didn't use the word orthopathy, but we had it all along. We had incarnational ministry. We had uh, missiological anthropology, right? Mm. We, we had terminology that said the same kind of thing. Yes. Um, and, and, and now we're kind of adding a new term that focuses specifically on the emotional content of the heart and how I have bowels of mercy for people and how I have concern and why I would shed a tear in prayer. You know, these, these things all of a sudden, um, we're, we, in this season, we seem to be focusing a little deeper on that heart element of it. Um, and, and as we um, come to a conclusion here, I think that is so apt, you know, how often do you find if you're out on a walk, people are, um, expressing that desire to connect with saying hello uh to wave um it's really precious to me I mean, not that we always find it i mean the tensions are also very pronounced um but i i would hope that we're growing an intentionality in the midst of the distancing to try and connect to try and find yeah. the right ways to connect to try and see others truly as they are and like you said not just simply to see ourselves through them where they become mirrors for ourselves and in a spirit of conquering. And uh, Phil, I just, again, I, I, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to connect with you and, and we'll have opportunities in the future. And uh, the work you're doing is something that I think anyone who's seeking to be a missional Christian, a mm -hmm. uh, missional Christ follower needs to account for um, because you've been doing it for a long time. Uh, very creative, very constructive, very charitable, as we're talking about orthopathy, uh, charitable orthopathy, and, and, it, and embedded biblically in how you're seeking to think through all this and live it out. And so I'm really grateful for our friendship over the years and looking forward to other opportunities. We don't have the Louisville grant oh, yeah. anymore, but we, we do find other opportunities <laughs> uh, to work through these matters. And hopefully we're going to be able right. to get to Austin next year, to Austin, Texas, as we Absolutely. were hoping to have that conference there in Austin where we take further these themes that we've been dealing with, with the Louisville Grand Initiative. So uh, Phil Wyman, John Moorhead was with us before, Paul Metzger, uh, really delighted to be here with you. Thank you for watching. Hey. You can Thank also you. listen to it on our uh, podcast for New Wine. So signing off now for Phil Wyman, John Moorhead, and myself, Paul Lewis Metzger. Thank you for joining us for New Wine Taste. Hey. Blessings. Thank to you. you.